Hi everybody, I'm here in the Lost Mandy virtual shop. Uh, in this particular tutorial, we are going to take a moment and it's going to be more of a talkie and less of a showy. Uh, because at this point, if everything has gone uh, successfully and as you had hoped, you have a mount that is uh, set up correctly, the hardware is set up correctly, uh, the astronomical computer, the Gemini astronomical computer, is set up correctly and it's pretty much ready to go. And the question is sort of, okay, well, what's the next step? And the answer is, uh, it kind of really depends on the way in which you are observing. And by observing, I mean, that's a sort of a catch-all phrase for both visual observing and imaging. So when I talk about observing, I'm, I'm kind of meaning any way that you want to use an amount in your telescope. Um, but observing, it really depends on the way in which you're going to use these systems, and that's going to dictate by and large the types of approaches you use, whether we're talking about polar alignment or pointing models or so forth. And I find that there's a lot of confusion about this because a lot of folks will say or assume, for example, they need a pointing model when they're doing certain types of imaging, and it turns out that's not always the case. So what I want to do is talk about kind of what's next. What I mean by what's next uh, is that we're really going to look on the look about these three things. And the first is talking about it's very important to align your mount with the Earth's rotation, right? So this is, of course, polar alignment. Um, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're, of course, not aligning at the North Pole, you're aligning at the South Pole. But having your mount kind of correctly set up so that as it's offsetting the rotation of the Earth, it's doing it as accurate as possible. And that's kind of a really important thing. But that, again, depending on the way in which you're going to be using your mount, you're going to be doing it a little bit differently. Uh, the second is making sure that when you're using the go-to computer, so you are slewing your mount at certain targets because you either want to observe them or imaging them, um, you want to make sure those are as accurate as you possibly can get. And this is kind of what uh, talks about uh, or, or points at a pointing model. Points at a pointing model. Great. That's brilliant. Um, but pointing accuracy is very, very important here. Um, the third thing is that the target is going to remain centered when we are observing it, whether imaging or visual, and that is the tracking accuracy. And I want to go through each of these and talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about each of them and kind of how to think about it and what types of tools might be appropriate depending on the type of observing that you're doing. So as I mentioned, your goals are really going to dictate the best tools for the job, but also the best approach. And you're going to find that uh, some of these things aren't going to be important for you, depending on your approach. So we're going to go through three examples. Uh, visual observing, uh, which is just using a, uh, an eyepiece uh, to actually just visually observe things that are going out, on out there in the, in the universe. The second is imaging, but in a very simple example where you have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera and you don't have any computer. A lot of times folks will be doing this kind of as the sort of first step or first foray into imaging, or maybe they just enjoy it. It's super portable. It's super fast. A lot of advantages to that. But the way in which you do that is a little bit different than this last one, which I describe as computer assisted imaging, where you have a dedicated uh, astronomy camera or an astro camera. Uh, a, you can do this with a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. But in this case, we actually have a computer involved. And the computer uh, is a real game changer in terms of not only how you set up and do things, but uh, uh, being able to take advantage of some of the things that the computers do better than we could do on our own. So we're going to actually going to walk through each of these uh, here in just a moment. Um, we started out talking about this idea that there's those three things, right? Polar alignment, um, pointing model, and uh, tracking accuracy. So uh, very, very briefly, we're not going to go into this in great detail, but polar alignment is essentially aligning your mount's tracking axis with the axis of the Earth's rotation, right? You want to get that as accurately as you possibly can. Uh, there are... Uh, it, Good polar alignment is always important, and the better your polar alignment, the better everything else is going to work. It's kind of the foundation of this, but sometimes it's not always as critical uh, in certain circumstances that we'll look at than you would have in other situations. Um, so if you do good polar alignment, your sky motion is going to be more accurately tracked. You're going to have less drifting of your target. You're going to have less fighting with your guiding software you're using that. So Polar alignment really is the foundation uh, of, you know, good observing conditions for you and getting your mount to, to work correctly. 
The second thing we're talking about is pointing and pointing models. So there's sometimes been some confusion about what exactly is a pointing model. So this is my version. I'm keeping it very, very simple. You know, I know there's a lot of probably more technically accurate things and I'm not, my goal is not to give a precise definition. But when I think about pointing, I think about pointing is the accuracy of your mount when you're doing a go-to. So you actually type in the, the, the uh, nomenclature or the, the name of your target, like M33 or NGC 6060. And when you press the go to, uh, that your Gemini computer is gonna look up that, op that object in its database and slew to where it thinks it is in the sky. And of course, in a lot of cases, the internal model that's built into your Gemini computer and the external world aren't quite aligned just yet. And so, uh, building a pointing model or getting pointing accuracy is kind of essentially how it really, really boils down to is how do you kind of align the internal model with the external world. Um, so a lot of times if you if you think about it, pointing models in the traditional sense, you actually do what's called building, building a pointing model. And that's where you use the Gemini computer, you issue a series of go-to commands. It will go to a target, you have to center it up, you have to actually say, okay, well, Wherever you thought that was, I'm going to use my arrow keys and you know my declination and right ascension axes, and actually move the the telescope so that the target is centered, either in my eyepiece or on the sensor, and then you essentially pr use a function called alignment and you align that, saying, "Hey, that thing that you went to, it's actually was over here." And what happens is you have the model uh, from your Gemini computer and you have the real world, and it's kind of just oriented them slightly differently so that they're a little bit more accurate as additional go-tos are done. And it's an iterative process. The more go-tos and alignments you do, uh, the more accurate that that pointing model is gonna be. Um, but with modern you know, computer-assisted uh, astroimaging and astrophotography, building a pointing model is not always required. So hang tight, because we're gonna cover that here in just a second. The last thing is tracking. So now that you're sort of on your target, um, you want the mount to essentially keep that target centered and unmoving in the middle of your eyepiece or your sensor. So in its very simple uh, state, uh, tracking is the speed at which your mount's RA axis moves, the right ascension axis or the you know, sort of the bigger uh, axes typically. And uh, it's important to know that uh, tracking really is offsetting the Earth's motion, and it really only happens in one axis. Although you do have a declination axis, uh, it's primarily used for go-to. So of course, you know, the whole telescope has to move on both axes to point to the target that you want. Uh, but also it's used in guiding. So as the uh, guide star moves about, the declination axis actually doesn't do anything until it's told to do something by, uh, by the guiding software to move in a certain direction. Uh, if you are just tracking, the only motor that's actually running continuously is the right ascension uh, axis motor. And that's running at 15.041 uh, arc seconds per second. That is what's known as sidereal tracking. There are other types of tracking. Uh, of course, if you're uh, pointing at the moon, you have lunar tracking. If you're pointing at the sun, you have solar tracking. There's something called king rate, which is not typically used, uh, but there are other options. But you know, for 99% of the, the situations in which you're imaging not the moon and not the sun, you're gonna be using uh, sidereal tracking. Um, sometimes, uh, depending again, depending on what you're doing, uh, the, the basic tracking uh, of your mount is really gonna be enough. Uh, and we're gonna talk about examples uh, of going through and doing that. There are ways to improve uh, the basic mount tracking. And it's not something we're gonna get into right now, but if you hear terms like periodic error correction or PEC uh, done through software programs like PenPro, if you ever hear ideas of sky modeling from other mount uh, manufacturers, so for example, Software BISC has ProTrack, uh, Astrophysics has APCC uh, and APPM, which is the point mapper. And, uh, you know, those systems are actually, will model the entire sky. They go through and take pictures and kind of plate solve them and then build a little bit more accurate pointing model. <clears throat> but these are all essentially the same idea, right? That we want the basic mount tracking to be as accurate as you possibly can. Um, if that's not 
quite working. And often that is the case. There's just a lot of small little variables that are going on. The polar alignment isn't quite right. Um, you're pointing at a certain part of the sky where sidereal tracking isn't quite uh, accurate. And again, that's very common. You know, the sidereal rate is actually a, a kind of an average or an estimate <clears throat> of tracking the changes across the sky, depending on whether you're uh, closer to the horizon or maybe closer to the meridian. Um, the actual rate does change a little bit. So um, there is a lot of the changes. And, and essentially what you want to think of in terms of guiding, uh, when you guide, it's really kind of, it's the last ditch effort to kind of clean up and fix all the things that um, should be really working correctly. But for whatever reason, right or wrong, it's not. So guiding is really, I think about it as kind of the, the cleanup batter to try to fix everything uh, that didn't quite go right. But it is not as some people might think about it, the first thing that you want to be doing, right? It's it's uh, kind of the last thing when you've done everything you possibly can in terms of polar alignment and other things uh, to make sure that it's working correctly. So we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. So let's get into the specifics uh, when we talk about the types of observing and um, you know how you're going to use your telescope. And then it's going to dictate how you're going to approach uh, these three uh, important performance characteristics. So when we talk about visual observing, right, you're going to use an eyepiece, you're going to be looking at things. Um, when you do polar alignment, um, you're not typically when, when you have visual observers, you're not going to be bringing out a, a, a computer with you. And so your polar alignment is primarily done with the polar alignment scope. Uh, and it's an accessory that we sell. Um, lots of other scopes, of course, have them, but it is a visual sighting where you have a little template uh, that you line up and you actually physically, as you're looking through this eyepiece, change the altitude and azimuth adjustments of your mount so that your mount is correctly polar aligned. Um, and that's fine because a lot of times if you're looking at uh, or you're observing visually, uh, if something moves slightly or drifts a little bit, you can always just use the, the um, hand controller and just kind of nudge a little bit and keep it in the center. You don't want to do it too much because after a while it becomes kind of a pain in the butt. But if you have good polar alignment, the better your polar alignment it is, uh, you know, the less you're going to have to be doing that. With regard to pointing accuracy, this is where you really want to build a pointing model. You know, when you first set up your mount and you're going to do the polar alignment and everything, it's probably not going to be that accurate for your very first go to. That's very typical because. The mount may not be quite centered. It might be slightly off. Your polar alignment might be slightly off. And that's to be expected. Your very first go-to is probably not going to be super duper accurate. Hopefully it'll be accurate enough uh, that you can go to a bright star and, you know, kind of be close enough that you can just finish it up by centering it and getting it uh, correctly aligned in your eyepiece. But the pointing model is a very important part of visual observing that allows you to, as you build it and refine the pointing model, uh, be able to use go to the go-to computer, the Gemini go-to function, and have your next targets be accurate and in your field of view. And that's pretty much what it all blows, uh, boils down to. Uh, you can also, and this is becoming much more popular, use mobile devices with a planetarium software program, such as Sky Safari. And Sky, uh, Sky Safari has uh, a thing called SkyFi that allows you to uh, wirelessly connect into your Gemini and be able to actually control this through this, uh, the um, planetarium program on your mobile device. Um, and that's a great feature and can be used in conjunction with visual observing. It's, I mean, it's a great way to do it. Uh, it requires a little bit more technology, but again, there's not really a dedicated computer there that's driving them out and doing things. I mean, I mean, I guess technically it is because it's a mobile device doing this, but really it's kind of a nice interface that you can see. And that pointing model uh, can be built uh, in combination with a tablet type of uh, planetarium program. But oftentimes to start out, you're really building that pointing model the first time using your hand controller. When you're doing tracking then, tracking becomes less important uh, because really all you're doing is just uh, running the mount, typically at sidereal rate, unless of course it's uh, you're observing the moon. Uh, things like guiding and periodic error correction and other types of stuff just really aren't that critical when you're doing visual observing. And again, this is a very general notion. So if you're doing visual observing and it's really, really deep, deep field or a very long focal length, of course, that would change. 
Uh, but basically you're going to be doing sidereal tracking and that's really all you need to worry about in terms of the tracking for visual observing. When we talk about um, a DSLR or a mirrorless, mirrorless camera for imaging, and again, in this particular example, I'm talking about just taking your camera, snapping it to the back of your uh, telescope, no computer involved. Um, it kind of blends some of the aspects of visual observing in the way that you do things with kind of this notion that you're imaging. So oftentimes the polar alignment, again, is done with a polar scope primarily because you don't really have an option of doing computer assisted uh, polar alignment. Um, but there are other solutions out there such as Polemaster um, and the iPolar scope. Uh, and in, there's a particular implementation uh, and I encourage you to look at this. I'll try to post some links in the description below, but these are systems that can actually be used not with a dedicated computer, but with a mobile device. Um, like a tablet or a phone or something like that. So you essentially just connect it directly from their little tiny camera that comes with these uh, systems, the Polemaster or the iPolar, and you plug it into your uh, mobile device and essentially use an app that, that uh, allows you to do much more accurate uh, polar alignment. It's very, very cool. Um, at, the, at the time of this recording of this video, that mobile device kind of interface doesn't seem to be kind of it's not really that mature yet, so the support for it seems to be kind of sketchy. I mean, I, I hope I'm wrong and I hope it's sort of evolved a little bit, but for example, the Polemaster, I think uh, the mobile device software was kind of in a, kind of a beta or test form and it never really, or at least hasn't yet made it out of there. If you know something different, you know, please leave a comment in the description below. Uh, I'd love to know more and I'm sure the people watching this who are shooting with a DSLR or mirrorless exclusively probably would like to, to know that as well. So then when it comes to pointing accuracy, uh, you want to be model building again because you don't, you're don't you not able to use a computer and some of the more advanced techniques we're going to talk about next. So you still want to have whatever target that, you, that you're slewing to with a go-to command, you want that target to be on your sensor. You don't want to be fishing around trying to find this when you don't, uh, when you don't really want to be. So building a pointing model using the Gemini uh, computer and the go-tos and the aligns, um, which is going to happen in a separate uh, tutorial. That's an important part of what you're doing here in terms of making sure that the thing that you're going to go to is going to land on your sensor and you can kind of finish up centering it and then go off to imaging. Um, now that we're talking about imaging uh, with your D DSLR or mirrorless, now tracking becomes important. And uh, Tracking oftentimes is not sort of, are you tracking well or not, but kind of what's the longest exposure you can get away with, with given kind of the accuracy of your tracking and your mount. This is where polar alignment becomes very important because we're not guiding. So we have to rely on the mount accuracy uh, to essentially keep everything uh, from moving. So polar alignment, super critical. The pointing accuracy is not critical in terms of the tracking. It's just nice to have it there to get the um, target in the center of your sensor. But uh, polar alignment is very critical for that. Um, you could also look at things, uh, although you're tracking in sidereal time, which again is the basic uh, rotation of the Earth speed, uh, you can also look at more advanced techniques like periodic error correction as ways to improve tracking. And by improve that, what I really mean is you can take longer exposures and still have your stars come out round, which is really kind of what we're after. So if you find and you're doing digital uh, DSLR or mirrorless imaging and your stars aren't uh, are oblong or sort of show uh, stretching and things like that, the first thing I always look at is polar alignment, you know, making sure that's as accurate as you possibly can. And then you can start reducing your exposure time to find a point where those stars really are gonna turn, uh, are gonna come out round for you. And then as you work to improve things, the goal is to extend that amount of time. So if it's 60 seconds or 120 seconds, you'll be able to go on longer, maybe you know three minutes or five minutes, because this is essentially unguided imaging, right? It's kind of tricky, even though it's a, a simple startup kind of way to do it, where you have just a camera and a telescope. In a lot of ways, you're not able to take advantage of the things that really make long exposures uh, easy to do uh, by use of a computer that's there. So this brings us to kind of where most of us either 
want to be or end up, which is uh, in this idea that you have a computer out there and you have a computer assisted uh, situation with an astro camera or even with a DSLR mirrorless where the computer is actually managing the mount and the guiding and other types of things. Uh, and with computer assistance, that means there's a lot more things that, that happen that can be kind of run or managed by the computer. And it does, frankly, a better job than we really could, whether we're visually citing something or, you know, trying to uh, track things. So when we bring a computer in, we're talking about our goal is to image for an extended period of time. Uh, this might be, you know, three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes per exposure. And we want to be able to do this for hours and hours and hours uh, every night and possibly even uh, do it for multiple nights, multiple nights in a row. I mean, a lot of times these, these targets, the dim targets might take two or three days or a week or a month, or maybe you're going to revisit it periodically every couple of years. And that's, you know, sometimes that's what it takes to get some really nice quality images out of this. So a computer is really the thing that's going to make that happen. In terms of the three kind of performance things we look for, now with polar alignment, we really want to take advantage of computer assisted uh, polar alignment. This is where things like Polemaster uh, come in. They have a software package that runs um, on Windows. There is, I think, a Mac version, but you know, as many of you may know, uh, the astronomical community today in terms of software is predominantly Windows based. So um, Polemaster works great on Windows. There's a program called SharpCap that has a built-in um, polar alignment routine that is incredibly accurate and I really like. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, but actually can produce better results than Polemaster. Um, there are things like uh, the guiding program PhD uh, gives you the ability to do drift align. Um, and that's a free system, so it takes a little bit more time and effort, but uh, it's free, which is great, and uh, is actually really quite accurate. But the point here is that with a computer, you can get a much more accurate polar alignment than you could with just a visual scope. And if your goal is to do long exposure, deep space astrophotography, this, these are the kinds of things you want to be looking at in terms of polar alignment. In pointing accuracy, and this is a real important point, chances are, or kind of what I would recommend and what you should be doing is not looking at building pointing models, but instead relying on plate solving. Uh, plate solving is you know, a relatively new idea uh, to the amateur uh, or enthusiast uh, astronomical uh, community. But this is essentially where your camera takes a picture and then your computer kind of looks up this picture and matches the star patterns and determines exactly where that is in space using either online catalogs or catalogs that have been downloaded uh, to your computer. It's incredibly accurate. And uh, the good news is you don't actually have to go through and either build a pointing model or have to sort of uh, rejuvenate your pointing model or bring your pointing model back uh, for the next night. It just happens every night and it works incredibly well and it, and it works um, kind of automatically. A lot of these software systems will do this and kind of center up your target without your direct involvement of it. So the important point about uh, computer assisted astro imaging is that when it comes to uh, pointing accuracy, you really wanna be focused on plate solving. And if you can kind of take that jump and adopt that technology, you're not going to be building any pointing models. I know this is a little bit different in the Gemini and the, in the Lost Mandy mounts because in other mounts, you kind of still had to build a pointing model anyways, just to kind of, I guess, you know, hint it or get it working. Uh, in the case of the Gemini, you don't need to do that at all. If you're doing plate solving, you just sort of boot it up, you'll cold start your Gemini, and you'll let the software kind of take over from there. So that's a really nice way to save time and still have an incredibly accurate uh, evening of astro imaging and pointing. In terms of tracking then, of course, we're gonna be doing most of our work in sidereal time because chances are it's uh, deep space astrophotography. But now we're gonna add in guiding, of course. And guiding allows us uh, with the use of a second guide camera and either a separate guide scope or an off axis guider, which is essentially kind of borrowing a little piece of your main telescope. It's gonna be watching stars. And as the star moves around a little bit, it's going to be issuing commands to the mount to, to essentially keep those stars from moving. Um, 
The important thing here about guiding, and we're going to cover this uh, guiding in, in a uh, future uh, tutorial, but the important thing here is that you're going to hear a couple of terms. You're going to hear the terms pulse guiding or ST4, um, and you're also going to hear terms like ASCOM and INDI. Um, and what you really want to be doing at this point is you want to be adopting pulse guiding, and that is done through either the ASCOM driver, uh, and we have a, a phenomenal one uh, written by Paul Konevsky. It's called the GeminiTelescope.net. That's the name of the software. I know it says .net at the end, but promise me it's not a website. It's actually a piece of software based on the .net, uh, Microsoft.net framework for software development. So that's why it's called GeminiTelescope.net. But that is essentially the ASCOM driver for uh, the Gemini astronomical computer. I'll put a link in below to where you can download the ASCOM platform uh, as well as the GeminiTelescope.net ASCOM driver. You might hear Indy, the term Indy, that is essentially the equivalent, roughly speaking, of ASCOM, but on other platforms, because ASCOM runs today only on Windows. So Indy is the version that runs in uh, ASI Air, it's the version that runs on Mac, the version that runs in uh, various flavors of Unix. But essentially, it's the same idea, right? That it's a connection uh, to your mount that then you can use pulse guiding through that. Um, the alternative, ST4, is uh, can certainly be used, but I really encourage you not to go down that path uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm not going to cover them all here. We've covered this elsewhere. But essentially, it's kind of an older technology that is not going to give you as good of results. It's going to take more effort. And when things go wrong, it provides you with less information to know what's going on. So for example, it doesn't report side of peer, it doesn't report uh, your guide speeds, you know, a lot of things that we would look at to try to figure out how to improve guiding. And that information is simply just not going to be there. So for guiding, you really want to be focused on pulse guiding via ASCOM, uh, which is the Windows platform, or via Indy, which is the Mac and, and Unix uh, platforms. Uh, one other type of imaging I just want to talk about briefly is planetary imaging. Uh, and again, this is typically done with a dedicated astro camera and a computer. You can also do this with a DSLR or a mirrorless camera in video mode. Um, and lucky imaging is not like, are you lucky or not? It's really a technique that has to do with taking a tremendous number of pictures, you know, think video quality, like 60 frames a second type of thing, or even higher. And uh, it's going to take as many of these frames as it possibly can, and then it averages them using special algorithms and software uh, that's different than, you know, your deep space imaging. Um, and what you're going to be doing is essentially averaging them all to find kind of the best combination of many thousands of frames that's going to produce the sharpest image. Um, and that's what lucky imaging is. And I'll put a link below that talks a little bit more about it. Um, so in this case, what we're talking about is taking many, many, many frames that are very, very extremely short duration, right? Fractions of a second. So yes, polar alignment, of course, is going to help, but it's not super critical because even if your target is moving off the chip or it's moving out of your reticle or whatever it is, um, you're still able to take a whole series of, of photographs of it in these very, very exposure times. So if you're using the hand control and just sort of repositioning it and getting that uh, target, like if it's Mars or Venus or you know, Jupiter or whatever, um, it can take that kind of uh, disruption and be able to then, of course, um, continue its imaging and know to reject the ones that you're moving the, the uh, sensor back over, you know, where the target is now centered in your, in your uh, field of view. Um, so polar alignment, of course, it's always nice to have, but, uh, and, and, but it's not super critical. Again, just makes life easier if you really do a good job on polar alignment. And because we have a computer for doing planetary imaging, things like Pole Master or Sharp Cap, all those ones are going to make your life a lot simpler in terms of producing a good polar alignment. Um, in terms of the pointing accuracy, it becomes, again, less important because there really isn't that many planets out there. So yes, of course, you don't want to be fishing around trying to find these planets, but you know, on any given night, there might be one or two or three of these planets. And uh, 
you know, getting a basic kind of a one point uh, pointing model probably will give you what you need in terms of just finding these uh, planets. So yes, pointing models kind of plays a role, but it's just not that critical because we're not really jumping around a lot. And, you know, the planets we're looking for are pretty well known in terms of where they are. Uh, the tracking accuracy is also less demanding of the mount as well. So if for some reason your polar alignment is off, as we just talked about, or for some reason something else is happening, it's low in the sky and the tracking rate is a little bit off, it's just not that big of a deal because you can always sort of recenter your target, the planet, and continue imaging, and that's not going to disrupt uh, the images that you're taking. That's very different if you're taking a five or 10 minute exposure and you're you know, your target is sort of slowly drifting off the sensor, that's going to be a huge problem for these long exposure deep space objects. But for planetary, just not that critical. Now that we've kind of covered that, I hope that that's helpful. Uh, if you folks have some tips or techniques uh, or want to sort of add some commentary about any of these approaches and the ways that uh, they're being used and the different types or styles of observing, please, I, I would love to read them. I'm sure anybody who's watching this video would love to read them as well. Um, next then, now that you understand kind of thinking about what you're going to do for polar alignment, what you're going to do for, uh, building a pointing model or not, and, uh, do, talking about, uh, tracking and guiding your mount. These are the things that we're going to cover in the subsequent tutorials here, but hopefully that gives you a good idea and overview of what these things mean and how they play a role, uh, and, and how they change depending on the type of observing, uh, that you're going to be doing. Yeah.